stunning statistics is that there are more tigers in captivity in the U.S. than there now are in the wild. A situation where under the USDA regulations, the cage only needs to be big enough for the animal to stand up and turn around in. So you can only imagine the small cages that people build that are actually legal and, and you know, could potentially be in our backyards right now. Tiger crisis, um, it, it, it didn't get to this point if everybody was aware that, you know, tigers need to be protected and tigers, wild tigers belong in Asia, in the wild, in their natural forest. When you see the kinds of places that these animals live, you, you start to realize that in some cases it's a, a fate worse than death. Hi, I'm Kristen Bauer for the Animal Legal Defense Fund. My character, the vampire Pam on True Blood, fends for herself just fine in her unlikely Louisiana home. But for one wild animal in particular, Louisiana is the last place on earth he belongs. Tony is a Siberian Bengal tiger who has been living on display as a tourist attraction at a truck stop outside Baton Rouge since 2001. In the wild, Tony might roam a territory of 100 square miles. But for the last decade, he has instead lived in a concrete enclosure plagued by the noise of diesel engines and the stench of gasoline. Years of living in isolation and confinement have taken their toll on Tony's health. Day after day, this magnificent cat is taunted and harassed by tourists. Instead of basking in the sun and hunting by night, Tony paces his cage a sign of extreme psychological distress. Confining a wild animal as a roadside spectacle is wrong. Join me and the Animal Legal Defense Fund in urging the state of Louisiana to revoke the permit that allows Tony to be kept at the Tiger Truck Stop, a permit that violates a state law designed to protect people and big cats like Tony. Help us win the fight for his freedom. Visit aldf.org slash Tony. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Educational Forum. I'm your host, Diane Sullivan. I have been an animal advocate and a lawyer for many years, but I have to admit that I did not know about the plight of tigers living in the United States until a former student, Rose Church, called me, explained the problem, and asked for my help. What I found out is that there are two issues. The first issue contributing to the tiger problem is what they call pay to play. Carol Baskin, the founder and the CEO of Big Cat Rescue, explains what pay to play is and its impact on tigers. We track all of the killings, maulings, and escapes by big cats on our website at bigcatrescue.org. And what was happening was there were so many people that were being mauled while they were paying to pet tigers or have their pictures made with tigers that USDA created a, uh, a requirement that you could not touch a big cat, a lion, tiger, leopard, after it reached the age of 12 weeks because they became too dangerous. Because they're wild animals. <laughs> they're tigers. <laughs> right, okay. In the case of Haley Hildebrand, she was a 17-year-old girl. It was very common in her area where she lived in Kansas to have your picture made with a tiger for your yearbook. And so like all these other kids had done, she went to this facility, had her picture made with a 600-pound tiger who killed her during the photo shoot. As a result, there was a huge outcry for a bill called Haley's Act that would end the contact with these animals. USDA had already said that you couldn't touch them after the age of 12 weeks. USDA came back and said you can't touch the cub up until the age of eight weeks. And the reason for that is the cub doesn't have sufficient immune uh, immune system to be able to deal with all of that handling. So what that did was it created an 8 to 12 week window, a one month window, in which people can still pay to touch these tigers. And as long as people will pay to touch these tigers, breeders and dealers will breed excessively to meet that demand. It really comes back to the public. If you could just stop the public from doing this, that it would save so many lives. So let me make sure I have this straight. I could go to perhaps a mall, 
pay $20 or maybe $75. Have my 20. 20. Okay, have my picture taken with a tiger cub who is between the ages of 8 weeks and 12 weeks. And then then I would leave with this cute little picture and the memory. Now, if somebody is making money out of this, which I'm assuming they must be, otherwise why would we have this going on, they would have to be breeding, it would seem to me, a tremendous amount of tigers each and every year to ensure that they have cubs open between the ages of 8 and 12 weeks. Am I right about this? That's correct. Do you have any idea of how big a business this is? We know that one vendor said that he could make over $20,000 in a single weekend at the mall. I know another person that breeds these animals who I had gotten a copy of an email that he had sent around mm -hmm. saying he needed 200 cubs per year just to be able to have all of his photo booths stocked. These photo booths are just, they travel around to malls, they put the cubs down on the floor in a cage, you go in, you have your picture made with the cub, and these cubs are being just constantly awakened and handled by the public. These are cubs that would spend two years or more with their mothers. So the mothers are being just bred to death to be able to provide these cubs for this purpose. And it's a horrible life for both the mother and for the cub. As you can imagine, being jostled awake, every time you try to finally drift off to sleep, these guys need a lot of sleep as cubs. And yet they're, every time somebody comes up with 10 or $20 to have their picture made, they're jerking that cub up and making the picture with them. So if there is only this one month window of opportunity to have your picture taken with a tiger cub, what happens to the tiger cub when it's 13 weeks old or maybe even a year old or particularly when it's full grown because we all know that a tiger cub grows into a tiger and they really are not suitable house pets? What happens to them? Unfortunately, we don't know in many cases where these animals end up. The ones we do know about always end up in horrible situations where they end up needing to be rescued because like you said, does somebody will take this animal in as a pet and think, well, it was used for these photo ops and it's handleable yeah. and so it's gonna be this great pet and then it gets to be a year, year and a half and they're like 200 pounds by then and the people are scared to death of them and they can't find a place fast enough to unload their animals. Tell me how they live at your sanctuary. What's life like for a tiger there? I've seen some delightful pictures of tigers actually even painting to amuse themselves. The biggest challenge that we face is trying to meet the emotional needs of these cats. Mm -hmm. You're talking about cats that in the wild would roam 400 square miles of territory. That would be their home base. So there's no cage that's going to be giving them a sufficient life. We do an awful lot of the stuff like you're talking about, giving them pumpkins and uh, watermelons and pools and a lot of interaction. We don't do any hands-on interaction with the cats, but just talking to them and um, trying to make their lives as, as pleasant and as peaceful as possible. The bigger issue is that we need to end the abuse at its start because there aren't enough sanctuaries, and even if they are, they, there were, these cats just don't belong in cages. The biggest leading cause for so many of these animals to end up in these horrific situations are that people will pay to have their picture made with a cute little tiger cub. And you can imagine how, how much people want to do that. They're so cute and mm -hmm. they will always justify it by saying, well, it's just this one time. And even though people always seem to know that there's something inherently wrong about that whole situation, about why am I able to touch this cub? Where's the cub's mother? They still manage to justify it by saying, this one time won't make a difference. This is something I want to do. This is something I want to give as a gift. And the result is that the people that breed these animals will constantly be breeding more and more cubs to supply that demand. If the public would stop, then the breeding would stop and it, this whole thing would just die out over time. The other major issue facing tigers in the United States is that there are no federal regulations prohibiting people who want to keep tigers as pets. Pet ownership is a matter of state law, and some states do not regulate the keeping of tigers or other exotic animals. Today, 21 states allow private citizens to keep a tiger as a pet, 
with as little a requirement as a license or a permit, and some do not even require that. Yeah, that's correct. And with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, because there's no permitting requirement, there's no tracking system. So we really don't have a sense of how many of these backyard tigers there are out there. So people can buy these tigers on Craigslist or Facebook. And, you know, with no training at all, you can basically can keep them like you would a domestic cat. The problem is after about six months old, they become a huge tiger. And then they basically become confined to a small cage, you know, living in somebody's backyard or in the basement or, you know, in a situation of an apartment building. And, you know, it basically outs the actual homeowner from whatever living quarters they're in. Did you ever envision yourself as going to the pet store or the, the barn down the street or Craigslist and getting a tiger? No, not at all. I mean, and to me, <laughs> the whole concept is just completely inconceivable. It just, when I heard about this situation and how prevalent it is in the United States, I was just in shock. And I think it took me probably three or four days to really come to the realization that this is a real issue and something that's really happening. Describe some of the backyard scenes that tigers are kept in. Well, the, the ones that I've seen, which have been mainly from rescue centers where they actually have gone and rescued these backyard tigers, they, they basically live in deplorable conditions. They're basically in just flat concrete cells that are, you know, no bigger than the size of a parking space. And it's completely legal under the regulations as they are right now. Um, and it's, it's really sad because the tigers actually pace, which is something that they shouldn't naturally be doing. Um, and they're not given any kind, type of natural habitat. So they're basically out there you know, in the wild, in, in a concrete, not out in the wild as they should be, pacing back and forth with um, basically nothing to do. And they're given probably not even enough meat that they were supposed to have. Why did you get involved with trying to help put an end to the problems surrounding the life of tigers in the United States? Well, I first got involved working for a nonprofit, which was one of my pro bono projects. Um, and we were really looking at the Tony the Tiger situation down in Louisiana. And when doing research for that, I realized that, you know, Tony was just one of maybe 15,000 tigers living in the United States. And that really there was a serious problem with the laws and the regulations. And, you know, as an attorney, I felt like it was kind of my duty to, to step in and try to solve the problem in whatever capacity I could. While doing research on the tiger problem, we spoke with individuals from a few of the animal welfare organizations about their thoughts on the tiger problem. Adam Roberts is the executive vice president of Born Free USA. Adam has significant expertise in international wildlife trade and captive wild animals, and he serves on several committees, including animals in captivity. Born for USA is a national animal advocacy and wildlife conservation organization, and we have offices in California and D.C. and elsewhere. Uh, we also operate a primate sanctuary down in Texas, and our basic philosophy, much like our partners in the U.K. at Born Free Foundation, is to keep wildlife in the wild. Mm -hmm. And it's a very simple message, so that we're um, against the keeping of animals in captivity, provided that it's not humane captivity. It's kind of complicated because, of course, when we have a sanctuary for primates, that's captivity, but we try and give them as naturalistic an environment as possible so that they can live out the remainder of their days in peace with limited human interference in a natural surrounding, juxtaposed against 
treatment of animals in circuses or when they're caught for their fur or when they're killed in the wild for their parts. I want to talk a little bit about zoos and circuses and your position on that and ask you whether animals can really be kept humanely and safely in those conditions. Well, I think under certain cir circumstances you might be able to. I mean, the bottom line is that the way I see the modern zoo is that it's more for the human visitor than it is for the animals. And as long as it's created that way and run that way, it's not going to be a humane enterprise. And so we really have to, I think, break the entire zoo mold and start over again. What I could see is that zoos eventually evolve into sanctuaries mm -hmm. where they're not breeding animals, they're not importing them into the, from the wild, but they're actually serving as rescue facilities so that when someone is caught with tigers in their backyard and they're confiscated, they have a place to put that animal that can better attend to their needs than what they had before. Or if a bear cub, for example, is orphaned in the wild, there's a place for that animal to go when that is the most humane alternative. Tell me about Born Free's position on the tiger problem here in the United States. Well, it feeds right into everything I've been talking about in terms of keeping wildlife in the wild. I mean, obviously, when people are keeping tigers in captivity, uh, these are apex predators, and you can't sort of breed that or take that out of the animal. So no matter what construct you put a tiger into, when that tiger is in captivity, and more importantly, when that tiger is in captivity around humans, it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. And so part of our situation is trying to keep them uh, protected in the wild, but also out of human hands here in the United States. And and, and so we fight against the exotic pet trade where people have tigers in their backyards, their apartments, their living rooms, literally, because we know the human interactions that that causes and the fatalities and other injuries that come as a result. I'm a lawyer and I happen to know that what animals are kept in somebody's home or in their yard is a matter of state law. Mm -hmm. It does seem incredulous that somebody would think it would be okay to keep a tiger in their backyard. But I understand that that's a great problem here in mm -hmm. the United States, that in certain states that have no regulations to prohibit it, people keep tigers as pets. Yeah, that's right. In fact, it's popularly known thought but we think it's fairly certain that there are more tigers in captivity in human hands in the United States than there are left in the wild, which for us is an alarming statistic sure. to think about. You know, when you have maybe 3,000 tigers left in the wild where they belong, it, it really is alarming and, and concerning for us. And the other problem is that some states are particularly problematic, and in fact, Texas, where there's a proliferation of tigers in captivity, there may be more tigers in captivity in Texas than there are in India is the one remaining stronghold of the wild population of tigers. So it really is incongruous to me how A, people could want to keep these dangerous animals, and B, that states would allow these animals yeah. to be kept. The why of that, why, why exactly. would you want a tiger in your backyard kept in a little tiny enclosure? Why would you want to do that? Well, I think I can kind of understand that part of it. And, and it, it, it goes as, like this. Either it's because you want to have the biggest, baddest animal on the block, and it used to be the Doberman, and then it was the Rottweiler, and now it's the lion cub or the tiger cub, and that eventually grows into a pretty large and domineering animal. But on the other hand, as a parent, I can sort of understand, too, when you see a cub, a tiger cub, that is a cute and cuddly animal. It is incredibly affable, gregarious, playful. The problem is that when the person acquires that animal, they don't realize that eventually that animal is going to become a 300, 400 pound monster. <laughs> yeah, and, right. And then it becomes dangerous. And that's where you have animals that are either released into the wild of this country so that they're roaming around the streets of Birmingham, or they end up being the Humane Society's problem or dumped on a local facility, or they're taken out into public on a leash and actually bite people. So that's really where the problem comes in. So I can see the desire to acquire the animal that for some people, unlike me, there's, there's not the separation there where they say, okay, that's a cute animal, but I wouldn't want to own one or have my child around one. And for some people, that, that uh, leap doesn't ever get bridged. Yeah. A few years back, maybe a half a dozen at this point, I remember reading in the New York Times about the tiger that was in an apartment mm -hmm. in Harlem, I right. think it was. And, you know, the rescue um, officers had to come down the skyscraper and go through the window to try to sedate the tiger to get it out of the apartment building. How does a tiger end up in a public housing apartment building in New York City? Is it because it was purchased legally somewhere and then transported here illegally? 
Yeah, it could be acquired in any number of ways. It could be legally acquired or illegally acquired. Obviously, it depends on the state where the problem is happening. And when you have a situation where, you know, in Connecticut, it's illegal to own a tiger, but in Pennsylvania, you can get a permit to own one. It's very easy with that patchwork of state laws to acquire the animals and move them around in interstate commerce. And so people get these animals and they get them in their houses. And I, for one, if I was the super of that building, wouldn't want to go tell that guy that he has to get rid of the tiger. I think he also had some big reptiles, like an alligator in his Yeah, I think that's right now that you say that. So sure. I'd be a little fearful yeah. about going into that apartment. And yeah. I think that's what people prey on. Another problem with respect to tigers and particularly tiger cubs that grow into tigers is this pay for play notion at the local malls where in certain states, I guess, exhibitors bring tiger cubs and during a period where the tiger cub is eight to 12 weeks old, you can go play with it or have your picture taken and it's a big money maker for the exhibitor. Could you comment on that and how much that contributes to the breeding and the problem with tigers here in this country? Yeah, well, as long as there's going to be profit made by showing those animals to the public, allowing the public inter to interact with those animals and take pictures with those animals, there's going to be a problem with those animals long term. First, it, it feeds the breeding because obviously when there's profit to be made, there are people who are going to want that money and greed takes over. Yeah. You're going to breed the animals and try and display them to make the buck. But then what happens when the animals are too old to show? Well, they either get shipped off to some substandard facility where their lifestyle is horrible and they're uh, inhumanely treated, or they're killed for their parts. And we have evidence that the meat of these tigers ends up in the trade and the meat trade, exotic meat trade, or the animals end up, as we've talked about, in somebody's backyard as a pet. So it really does feed the problem to allow these animals to be shown to the public. And of course, in some situations, you have animals that are older being showed in the public that are more grown up. And there was one instance in the Midwest where somebody was killed, a teenage girl was killed by an animal during a photo op. So you think that having an animal like a tiger on a leash is somehow going to be OK, <laughs> but obviously it's just not. Let's talk a little bit about the international trade of tiger parts, the problem of some of the folklore of the Chinese believing that tiger bones put in medicine or stews or whatever they're used in is something that I would imagine born free is up against. Yeah, that's right. It is a huge problem. Uh, the international trade in tiger parts, much like the international trade in elephant ivory or rhino horn or bear gallbladder, hugely profitable on the black market. And while the international community does not allow legally the movement of tiger parts, it's illegal to trade internationally in these parts, uh, the profit that can be made by the illegal trade is pretty enormous. And so you have tiger penis, tiger bone wine, tiger skins, claws, teeth, everything having a market value on the black market. Yeah. Now, two of the problems that comes from that relate to the source of these animals. Uh, on the one hand, you have businessmen in China who are quote unquote farming these tigers, keeping them in these breeding facilities and spending thousands and thousands of dollars to maintain the animals every year. And so naturally they're putting pressure on the government who in turn put pr puts pressure on the international community to open up the legal trade so that those businessmen can finally see some profit on their investment. But as long as that's happening, as long as there's pressure and there's a black market for these items, there are poachers who are paying a dollar for a bullet and taking the animals from the wild to feed into the trade. So really, as long as that international trade happens and there's not a firm message from all governments around the world, including China, that it shouldn't be happening, tigers are going to be vulnerable in the wild. Is there anything our viewers can do to help with getting a message out there that this is not acceptable? Yeah, well, really, it would help for them to contact us at Born Free okay. so that we can take that message forward when we go to these international treaty meetings. Uh, it's called the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, and there are 175 or 176 countries that participate, including the United States, and we need to be able to tell the international community, including the United States government, that our citizens are strongly against any trade in uh, tiger parts, um, but then also writing to the government itself, write to the Department of the Interior and let them know that we need the strong strongest possible regulations globally to prevent any tigers from being killed for the trade. Last question, Tony the Tiger. 
How hot wrenching is that? Tony's living in a cage at a truck stop. Is this going to end for Tony? Do you think? Well, I think it will. And and I'll tell you, you know, you describe it as heart range wrenching, and it, and it is, but it's also inspiring because that was one situation where I personally, I have to admit, I'm I'm guilty of this. I looked at that situation for many years, and I could not find a way out. I couldn't find a solution. I couldn't figure out how we can get this tiger out of this parish in Louisiana, where obviously the people who are entrenched there and the decision making <laughs> had no interest in doing so and and our friends at the animal legal defense fund had a great campaign and a successful campaign and now the question is come the end of the year if his permit is in fact not able to be um, uh, renewed what's going to happen to Tony and and quite frankly we've offered is if his health is strong enough to take him to our sanctuary in India now I know that's a big if but God knows that would be an amazing end for that tragic story. But even if we got him to one of the sanctuaries like Big Cat Rescue in the U.S., it would still be just so wonderful That's for Tony. That's just where I was going. I was going to ask, is there any possibility you could take Tony if things work out to India? Absolutely. Or certainly Big Cat Rescue would be another great organization. Yeah, we have to make that judgment call. You know, is he healthy enough to make that trip? But if he is, absolutely. Yeah. And, and he could actually be back where tigers belong. National Fund for Animal Welfare, known as IFAW, is currently one of the largest animal welfare and conservation charities in the world. Their mission is to improve the welfare of wild and domestic animals throughout the world by reducing commercial exploitation of animals, protecting wildlife habitats, and assisting animals in distress. Grace G. Gabriel is the Regional Director of International Fund for Animal Welfare Asia. She joined the International Fund for Animal Welfare in 1997 as the China Country Director. In this capacity, she established the IFAR China Office. She initiated and managed an array of conservation and animal welfare campaigns and programs. Headed by Grace, IFAR China works with the Chinese government to influence its current conservation policies increase coordination with the international community, and enhance enforcement of both domestic and international wildlife protection legislation. Well, wild tiger only exists in Asia. It's an it's a Asian species, and scientists believe that tiger as a species originated from China. Really? Yes. So um, a, a century ago, there were probably a, a hundred thousand tigers across Asian continent um, as you know as far wide to even to Iran to the Caspian Sea wow. and but in the past century three subspecies of tigers have become extinct including Caspian tiger Bali and Javan uh, tiger subspecies and in China, there is one subspecies of tiger called South China tiger subspecies, but this species hasn't been seen in the wild for over 30 years. So scientists believe that this species has already become ex extinct, except some individuals that are remaining in zoos. But China, even though, um, uh, you know, up until 1980s, China still had a policy of killing tigers as pests. And not until 1989, when China issued um, a Wildlife Protection Act, when tiger killing is, is, was banned. And today, China had fewer than 30 tigers in the wild. No, oh, wow. And, and across tiger continent, wow. there are there could be as few as 3,200 tigers across the continent 
in 13 Tiger Range states. But China is still very important for ti wild tiger conservation because China, in China's border with Russia, there is a subspecies that's Amur tiger, mm -hmm. which um, most of it live in, in Russia, in the far, Russian Far East. And it was in the past 50 years, that species had, had um, increased to about 40, uh, uh, 450 individuals. But today, that species is also threatened because of the demand for tiger parts in China. And in southern China, in, in China's border with Myanmar and Vietnam, and that region, there is also the Indo-Chinese subspecies of tiger that, that occasionally wander into, mm -hmm. into China. And that species is also very, um, uh, very much pressured by the trade, by poaching. Are there now laws in China to prohibit or attempt to at least regulate the, the poaching? So are there anti-poaching laws and other laws to restrict trade of illegal parts of tigers? There are, the China's wildlife protection law prohibits poaching of uh, tigers and many endangered species in the wild. However, China's policy um, is very much promoting trade. So under the policy, there are a few, um, um, well, there, there are a lot of farming operations that are allowed mm -hmm. um, in, in China, including tiger farming. Some of the large, largest tiger farms exist in China. Um, in total, there are um, over 6,000 tigers um, in, these, in the various farms versus fewer than 30 tigers in the wild. What are the tigers being farmed or bred for? Specifically, what's going to happen to those tigers? Um, in, um, supposedly, when, when China allowed these tiger farms to be set up, they, they were set up they, they, um, with the, um, with basically with the cover to say, with the excuse to say these tigers are bred for releasing them into the wild. But what, what actually happened that these tigers are speed bred. They are bred so the, the breeding strategy for these tigers on the farms is very different from breeding strategy for wild tigers. In the wild, in order to preserve diversity, mm -hmm. you know, the, the genetic diversity, you wouldn't breed so frequently. Right. But on the farms, in order to produce the maximum number of tigers, they breed them very quickly. The, the tiger, after a, a female breed, you know, three, within three months, that, that cub is taken away from the mother, so the female tiger will get into breeding again. So what happens is the, the diversity is, is very, it, it got very um, messy and compromised. And the tigers are not only breeding within, you know, just with other tigers, these farms also breed tigers with lions. So what it happens is, you know, these, these monster um, ligers that has no use ever in conservation. And tigers cannot, the tigers on the farms, bred on the farms, can never, never be released into the wild. And I would surmise that the conditions they're kept on in the farm are not ideal conditions for a tiger. No, they're not. And, and also, they, they are, a lot of the tigers are starved. And in order for them to, to engage in shows, uh, by, by shows, I mean um, they, would, they would sell tourists prey, tiger prey. So tourists can take a, buy a chicken, buy oh, a cow, mercy. release into the enclosure for the tiger to, to pounce pounce onto the, the prey. And in the wild, a tiger would hunt uh, individually by mm -hmm. itself. Yes. But in these farms, um, it, you can see a, a, you know, ti uh, 
a group of tiger, 20, 30 tiger pouncing on, on one cow or, or chasing one chicken. So these are many of the farms that also are uh, wildlife parks, safari parks. So what, what they do is um, they chain tigers to, to, um, to the floor and pose pictures for pictures with, uh, with tourists. So these tigers are, live a very miserable life on the farm. And then when they die or when they are killed, these farms are also selling the tiger parts wow. in wine. Wow. And in the name of, tea, uh, of traditional medicine, one of, the, one of the laws that China had passed, it, it, it wasn't a law, but it was a state council, China's highest level of government body. In 1993, responding to uh, international uh, uh, pressure to protect tigers, and tigers are already listed in CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, on, on Appendix 1, so international trade is banned. So in 1993, China State Council issued a notice banning tiger bone and rhino horn use in traditional Chinese medicine. And after that ban, the government actually started a lot of uh, education campaigns mm -hmm. within the TCM uh, medicine community to urge them not to use uh, tiger bone and rhino horn in medicine. So what it happened is the official TCM community have moved away from using tiger bone in medicine. But these tiger farms, they they are um, uh, they are basically they use tiger bone to produce a type of wine, and then they call it for medicinal oh, use. Boy. And sure. then they are. They are using people's, you know, in, in a lot of older people's, in their mind, yeah. tiger bone has, you know, medicinal powers. And so they are um, prying on those type of people and, and the, they, they, who treasure tiger bone in, in medicine and who still want to use it. As we sit here at the international headquarters, it's easy to cast a stone on what's going on in China and other countries. But here in the United States, there are also significant tiger problems and of course other endangered species, um, significant problems as well. Do you have any commentary on the link between what's going on in China with respect to the tigers and some of the abuse of tigers here in the United States? Um, in, indeed, you know, tiger crisis, um, it, it, it didn't get to this point if everybody was aware that, you know, tigers need to be protected and tigers, wild tigers belong in Asia, in the wild, in their natural forest. And in fact, in the U.S., um, there, the, the number of tigers that are kept in captivity, the number is even higher than the, those that are China, on China's tiger farms. And tiger is not even an indigenous species on this continent. So in, for, the, for the people in the, for the U.S. government um, and for the people in, in the U.S., they need to be aware um, of if they really care about tigers, then we need to have stronger laws. We need to have stronger position to keep tigers in the wild, to regulate, make sure yes. that the tigers in captivity in this country do not go into uh, illegal trade and which stimulate a market demand, which fuels poaching of tigers in the wild. Nathan Hirschler is an attorney and international operations manager with IFAW, the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Prior to joining IFAR in 2008, he graduated from American University, Washington College of Law, where he focused on environmental and animal law. Nathan has co-chaired his Student Animal Legal Defense Fund Law School chapter. He's lectured on animal law issues and volunteered with a number of animal advocacy groups. 
Can you tell me how pervasive the captive tiger problem is here in the U.S.? The problem is pretty widespread. Um, there's been a number of advancements over the, the, the past 15 to 20 years or so, uh, most recently with the passage of the Captive Wildlife Safety Act in 2003. Um, after that came into effect, uh, there was a ban on interstate transport um, on a number of big cat species defined as prohibited wildlife species under that act. Um, it protects species that uh, including lions and cougars, which weren't necessarily already protected under federal law, um, but that became so because of that act and remained only protected under federal law because of that act. Um, that being said, there are still a substantial number of big cats in captivity in the United States, both in uh, private hands kept as pets and also in sort of corporate type of farms that uh, are using these animals for um, for commercial activities like bringing them to malls where uh, they ask people to take photo to take photos with the big cats um, as part of you know uh, activities that will bring folks into malls. Where does one go about purchasing a tiger? Mm. Um, it's not as simple as going to a local pet store or, or that but uh, there are a number of states where private ownership of big cats is just not prohibited in the United States. It's legal or it's legal with a permit. Um, the number of states have declined where that's allowed in the last number of years but uh, you can still go to some of these states where, um, where the private ownership is allowed. Um, or you can find them on the internet, a simple Google search away, you can purchase your own big cat. Why would states allow this? There's a substantial amount of money in it to, in some instances. Um, states sometimes allow it because they think of it as a private ownership issue. Uh, they don't like to see government getting involved in the private ownership of, of property. Um, they think that it's somebody's right to own wildlife. Um, it's hard to speculate on a state-to-state -state basis. There are a number of different reasons why they would do it. Um, but I think that uh, a lot of the times it's really just inertia. Um, I think that they don't see it as a substantial problem in their states, so there's not a lot of uh, effort being put into changing the way that they actually regulate the ownership of big cat. Other than the obvious danger of a tiger escaping and harming someone, are there other things to worry about? Yeah, so there, there's a number of issues. I mean, there's animal welfare issues. A number of these cats are being kept in horribly tight confinement, um, you know, spaces, small cages that are the equivalent of, of, you know, dog cages that you see for, that, you know, you only will transport your dog for a couple hours in one of these things just to keep them safe. But these tigers are living their entire lives um, in, in equally small and cramped behavior. It, it, so there's massive animal welfare problems with that. There's also um, issues of public safety. Um, you know, when you're dealing with these private owners of big cats, there's always the possibility of maulings, there's the possibility of escapes. Um, and then there's also international conservation issues. We suspect, although we don't have any proof at this stage, that a number of these animals are actually being put into uh, international and domestic wildlife trade uh, for use in either traditional Asian markets for as medicines, um, where the tiger in particular, tiger bone wine, is thought to increase both virility and strength in its drinkers. Um, and there's an increasing demand for that that's putting extreme pressures on wild populations of tigers, but we also suspect maybe putting pressures on domestic farmed populations. Um, and the same holds true for other species of big cats, lions, for example, um, that are sometimes used as replacement products for those tigers when they become more scarce. Uh, there are also additional threats on the ground to a number of these species, poaching in particular, um, or trophy hunting for species like lions, where the, the import of those trophies is not actually prohibited at this time in the United States. What are some challenges that we face? Probably the number one challenge is the fact that people don't think of this as a major problem. Um, the people who are out there trying to interact with these animals, the cubs that you're allowed to play with at these shopping malls, for example, they like animals, they love animals, they want to be near these animals, and that's really the cause for them willing, being willing to pay these $10, $20 for a photo opportunity with them. Um, so to some extent, one of the biggest challenges is overcoming the public awareness of what the actual side effects of having these cubs and malls is actually going to be. Um, 
we also have challenges in Congress, of course, as everybody knows right now, there's huge impasses over the budget, over uh, the role of the federal government implementing wildlife reforms, and, um, and overcoming that just on a, on a federal law basis is a substantial challenge for anybody trying to do the type of work that our organization does. Ian Robinson is a veterinarian and IFAW's Emergency Relief Program Director. He began his career in general veterinary practice in the UK, but for the past 15 years, he has worked full time in animal welfare. Ian worked first with the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, where he helped open the largest wildlife rehabilitation hospital in Europe, treating over 6,000 wildlife casualties per year from over 200 different species, from bats to badgers to sparrows to seabirds to seals and all kinds of animals. Ian joined IFAR in 2003, and he has helped the animals around the world, including responding to emergencies in many foreign countries as well as in the United States. It's interesting, actually, because my first job, really, when I first started with IFAR, um, was a tiger rescue. And uh, when I was going to, uh, to start my job, I was called by my new boss saying, can you start in time for the big cat rescue? And I said, oh, yeah, that'll be fine. I had no idea whether this was like... <laughs> just a big cat or like a tabby yes. <laughs> or a Maine Coon cat <laughs> and it turned out to be 24 tigers in a backyard in New Jersey oh my which we took out of quite appalling conditions and and moved to a, a sanctuary in Texas and I think one of the stunning statistics is that there are more tigers in captivity in the US than there now are in the wild um, uh, in the wild tigers are extremely endangered yet they are relatively easy to breed in captivity and there are large numbers of them unregulated yeah. in the US. And I think this is the, the basis of the problem. You can buy a tiger cub for about the same price as a good pedigree Labrador. And people will do this and in many states there are really no regulations to uh, control how the trade in, in, uh, in dangerous wild animals of all sorts uh, is, is undertaken. And so people will buy a cub, which sounds like a good idea at the time, then the cub grows, it becomes dangerous, it becomes often unwanted or they can't afford to keep it anymore, and then it becomes a problem. And that's often where we get involved, trying to find sanctuary for these animals which people can no longer cope with. Now, I'm a law school professor, and one of the things that I have great interest in is the animal welfare. So I'm aware more than the general public about the problems with respect to animals in this country. Approximately three months ago, I found out that people had in their backyards in Texas and other parts of the country, tigers. I was shocked. Shocked is an understatement, really. I, I wonder what people think when they decide that they're gonna keep a tiger in their backyard. To me, common sense tells should tell you that you cannot keep a tiger like you would keep a cat or a dog. Absolutely, and wildlife belongs in the wild, whatever sure it, it is. Does. But people do get attracted by the beauty and the grandeur of these animals. And, and um, there is that acquisitive streak in people which, which wants to own. You know, they want to own and want to have one of these animals for themselves. And they don't really consider the uh, the implications of that. Keeping wildlife like tigers in captivity is an extremely complex, expensive and specialized business and should be left to those organizations like zoos that have the wherewithal to try and do it properly. Uh, and often the result of trying to do it and not being able to do it properly is these animals end up needing a home and that's where the sanctuary community of the US comes in to try and rescue these animals and give them um, a, a good environment for the remainder, remainder of their lives. My understanding is many of the sanctuaries now are full and because we have such a problem in the United States. So I would imagine that it's quite hard when you get a call that there are a number of tigers in a backyard somewhere that are being kept in horrible conditions. You need to find a way to go in and rescue them, but then you also have to relocate them somewhere. So. Walk me through what it's like to, to relocate a tiger. Well, it, it is a tremendous problem because, particularly in this, this time of economic recession, yeah. it's becoming more and more difficult for the sanctuaries who are providing for these animals 
uh, to keep going. In fact, there has been a recent case of a sanctuary gone bankrupt, and then the 100 plus tigers and lions and other big cats that they had in sanctuary had to be farmed out throughout the, the whole wow. of the US to other sanctuaries that could provide them with a decent home. And that was an extremely difficult, and it actually is still an ongoing process that we're going through. We haven't quite rehoused all of the tigers that they have. Um, a sanctuary which takes on the, the job of caring for one of these animals and giving them a good home for the rest of their lives is taking on a, a tremendous burden, uh, both financially and in terms of the care that, that's required. Uh, and this is a real problem. And the problem is there are more and more tigers being produced. Now, one of the reasons for this is that people uh, want to pet tigers. And so there is a market for, uh, for, for people to handle and pet tigers. And it is still legal in this country to be able to handle and have the public interacting with tigers within a certain age group, which is sort of eight to 12 weeks. Now that's a very, very short time scale. So in order to have these animals to make a profit out of allowing the public to handle them, people will breed tigers, and then each of those tigers has to, be, has to go somewhere. So they're sold as pets or whatever, and then those tigers get into trouble and end up in sanctuaries, but the whole time there's this big machine which is creating more and more animals which need help. And so there's a, it's a never-ending problem. The only way, the only way that this is ever going to be come under control and the only way it really is going to be stopped is national legislation. Oh, certainly. I mean, I sit here and I listen to you now and it seems to me that it's common sense that we ought to not allow people to interact with tiger, tiger cubs between the ages of eight weeks and 12 weeks because that's a month. And so you must have people that are continually breeding, tremendous amounts of tiger cubs so that they always have them available because of course they can make money from doing this and think of the life of the tiger afterwards how sad it is and of course now you're going to ultimately probably get called in to try to rescue what is an unsuitable pet from the backyard of somebody and now you have to find a home and the sad thing is the tiger ends up living in captivity for its life and that is not an ideal solution to the problem absolutely and Although each state is different, and some states have already outlawed the keeping of dangerous wild animals such as tigers by the general public, it does go state by state, and in many states it is still legal, and in many states you will find uh, people who, who still acquire these animals as pets, and then often keep them in unsuitable conditions where they suffer. There is also the significant danger, not only to the owner, but also to the public if these animals escape or if people get in with an animal because they're not expecting there to be a tiger on the premises, these, these kind of things. So there is a, a considerable um, public safety issue involved with this as well. The Massachusetts School of Law has a very dedicated animal law program. Here are our two students. Well, this summer we've been working on an internship uh, together with another MSL alum, Rose Church, and it's in regards to uh, captive tigers and we're here to help create a multi-organizational effort to help combat captive, captive tigers and uh, to ensure that they're not being brought around to all the different malls. Uh, captive tigers are basically, captive tiger cubs are basically taken around to all different malls when they're between 8 and 12 weeks old, uh, where they are petted um, and just some horrible abuses are happening to these poor animals. And what do you think, personally, you guys can do to help this problem? Uh, personally, I would like to make it um, more aware to the public about the captive tigers in the United States, uh, especially in New England. Um, I was shocked by um, the numbers, anywhere between 5,000 and 12,000 captive tigers, and I would like to make that more aware to the public. I think that I agree with Caitlin. Education is really key at this point in time because in New England we have no idea that this is going on and as Caitlin indicated there are so many tigers that are being held in inhumane conditions that education is really a key factor right now. Now I know you both took animal law. Have you worked on animal issues before? I have worked uh, at the local level. I've worked with a local shelter uh, where I've helped foster dogs. Uh, I also created a, a program for people with disabilities where they collect donations 
and then take it into a shelter. I, um, in high school, was on um, a wild animal rescue um, team and we would um, take care of like squirrels and take care of uh, eagles and hawks and different things like that. And then in college I was in an animal club and did um, things throughout the animal club. And now at law school, I took the animal law class and hopefully helping the tiger situation. It seems that it always takes a tragedy before people will see a problem and act. On Wednesday, October 19, 2011, 56 exotic animals, including lions, tigers, bears, giraffes, wolves, were freed from their captivity at a rural residence outside of Zanesville, Ohio. Police report that the animal's owner, Terry Thompson, let the animals out of their cages before he killed himself. When the carnage was over, 49 animals were slaughtered, including 18 Bengal tigers, 17 lions, six black bears, a pair of grizzlies, three mountain lions, two wolves, and a baboon. Only six animals, one grizzly bear, three leopards, and two monkeys were captured alive and taken to the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. This tragedy should not have happened. It is time to take action. Write or call your congressman and tell them we need a federal ban on keeping wild animals as pets. It's common sense. Tell your congressman to pressure the USDA to close the 8 to 12 week loophole. Volunteer, contribute to one of the many animal welfare organizations that you saw on this show. Finally, please, please do not pay to play with a tiger cub and do not have your picture taken with a tiger cub. So until next time, be the voice for those who cannot speak. Become educated on the things that you care about, like this topic. And above all, you be well. I think we have a really good case for getting them to close the mm -hmm. window. And the reason is they say up into eight weeks, the cat doesn't have sufficient immu immunology. And so what they didn't take, they got it partially right. They got it partially right in that the cat does not have a, a, a proper immune system. But the fact is, with domestic cats, as probably all of your people know, you give kittens shots at eight weeks, 10 weeks, and 12 weeks mm -hmm. before they're actually protected. It's the same way with tiger cubs. So they're not even protected until 12 weeks. USDA has already said at 12 weeks, they're too dangerous for handling. So what we hope to, to present to them is to say, you guys got it right, they aren't protected, but they're not, in, they're not protected to the 12 week. And if we can just close that four week window, it seems like it would be such an easy thing. It is such a problem at the state level and because the states have been delegated the, the responsibility for controlling the trade in exotic animals and the keeping of exotic animals as pets. One thing we had great success in doing uh, about eight years ago was passing the Captive Wildlife Safety Act, which yes. prohibits the interstate movement in big cats like tigers, lions, leopards, cougars, or even hybrids if they're gonna be kept as pets. And so full enforcement of that law which is not currently happening, would be a huge boon to stopping the interstate movement of these animals and really localizing the problems so that states and communities can actually address the problems themselves. I think the other thing we need to do is focus on those states that still allow the trade, go to those state legislatures, show the incidents that have happened in their states that have been uh, problematic, where children have been bitten or otherwise hurt, show the number of people that we think are keeping tigers in those communities and why it's a risk and urge them literally one by one to change the state law so that there won't be any communities left in the country where these animals can be procured. I think there's a number of things that we can do and there's a multitude of options on the table um, but it's they're all difficult and there's all it's a difficult slog all the time trying to pass federal legislation trying to pass regulatory change um, at the state and the federal level. Um, I think that obviously the holy grail in all of this would be to it would be a ban on the private ownership of big cats with certain exemptions for obviously reputable sanctuaries, for potentially for circuses, for zoos. Um, uh, we, haven't, we don't have an organizational position on that at this point, um, but there are clearly a lot of options out there um, that can help address this issue, and it's an issue that needs to be addressed. Without strong both federal and state support for proper and sensible legislation to control the ownership of dangerous wild animals, including big cats and specifically tigers, in the US, this will, this will continue and will be a constant problem 
So in for the for the people in the for the U.S. government um, and for the people in in the U.S., they need to be aware um, of if they really care about tigers, then we need to have stronger laws. We need to have stronger position to keep tigers in the wild, to regulate, make sure that the tigers in captivity in this country do not go into uh, illegal trade and which stimulate a market demand, which fuels poaching of tigers in the wild. Okay.